Welcome to Nevada Stories. I'm Christopher Von Nodge, the head of the Shared History Program at the University of Nevada, Reno, which is part of the Department of History. Um, our focus is doing applied history and community engaged history. I'd like to introduce four students of ours from the university, Sarah Gary Sage, Cassandra Andicoachea, Nancy O'Connell, and Brian David. They've been working on two documentary shorts and they'll be talking extensively about why they chose the topics they've chosen and the process. Sarah, Cassandra, and Brian focused on a project on food and food culture in Northern Nevada. So the Reno Food Project was started in the fall of 2019 and is an oral history exploration of contemporary Northern Nevada food culture. Over the past year and a half, we have done several oral history interviews with restaurant owners, chefs, magazine editors, food bloggers, local food advocates, et cetera, just really exploring what is Reno food and what food means to our interviewees. Uh, we hope to turn this project into a digital archive and digital website so that these stories are accessible to our broader community. Uh, so today we're presenting the What is Reno Food video. And the What is Reno Food video is really the project's first public-facing product. And so with that in mind, the overall goal of the What is Reno Food video is to introduce in viewers to the project and to give them a sense of what they can anticipate from this project going forward. We both saw it as an opportunity to pursue something completely different from our you know, typical academic research that we were undertaking for our thesis and our PhD respectively. Um, so it really was just a chance to explore something fun and something different. And then as we were collecting these stories, we realized there's really a wealth of information in our community and that there was room for the project to grow and that we thought it could provide an important service in bringing these stories and making those community connections. And I'll just jump in real quick. I think my interest in the project um, initially sten extended, stemmed from it being a, an oral history project first and foremost. Um, I was more so interested in oral history as a methodology. As Sarah mentioned, I think we were both interested in the project's potential for its ability to challenge us to do work that we hadn't done before. I think both of us were very familiar with doing work in the archives or doing work, very traditional historical kind of work. Um, and I think this project was a unique opportunity for us to engage in different kind, different methods of scholarship. Yeah, and um, I joined later. So they were looking for um, help on the project and um, it seemed like a great opportunity like everybody else to develop skills in oral history outside of the classroom. Um, also a way for me to be engaged with other people at the university and to develop like skills that aren't necessarily directly history related like opening up Premiere and um, just more technical skills that um, I would be able to have and develop over time. Between the just being, you know, having that resistance because I didn't really want to be here, combined with um, it was a huge recession. I mean, it was tough to find a job, and we struggled. Um, I, you know, I had withdrawals. Like I was used to this, you know, just fast pace. There's a restaurant on and a, and a, a thriving restaurant on every corner amazing famous chefs um i went to school with plenty of them and now you know there's this tiny community and and we're struggling mm -hmm. and i just didn't know anybody but the minute that i reached out even to the struggling businesses um it was like that you know i made lifelong friends so i don't know if that answered your question but it only took me a year, and now couldn't pay me to go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and it's changed a lot and it's grown a lot I mean just when I think like oh this is amazing it's not going to get any better you know Midtown expands and new restaurants are opening and it's not just all you can eat sushi I know Jonathan Wright I love him but <laughs> he has a big problem with our all you can eat sushi we're, we're, we're more than that few things I think of, um, like Miguel's. I think of going to Miguel's when I was little. With, my dad grew up going to Miguel's with my grandpa, mm -hmm. and I think of that, and I think of uh, going to Louie's with my family uh, when we would come up here to visit, and I think of, um, it's not around anymore, but I think of Kyoto's, mm -hmm. um, which was like our favorite Japanese place, and they knew my grandpa by name, <laughs> yeah. so even after he moved to Vegas, every time he would visit, and so I think of those kinds of places um, uh, and then I think of like in college going and getting a, an awful awful at the nugget <laughs> like really <laughs> early in the morning yes. and so um, there's just a lot of things that really bring me to Reno food. And Nancy has focused on a project looking at the role of the 1960 Winter Olympics in Squaw Valley, a place we now call Olympic Valley. Um, and the desegregation of Reno. I started the Sierra Ski Heritage Oral History Project in the spring of 2019 in collaboration with Shared History. I'm a lifelong skier. I have no memory of not skiing in the Tahoe Sierra. And when I realized how many stories were being lost to time, I went to Dr. Von Nage and said, hey, I've got this crazy idea. I want to record these stories. I want to preserve them for posterity. And in the process of doing that, I stumbled across this really unique unknown story about the key role that the 1960 Winter Olympics played in the civil rights movement and the desegregation of Reno, culminating in that a Civil Rights Act in 1965. I keep thinking that I'm getting to the center of this onion that I've been peeling back layer by layer. And the deeper I get into it, the more that I find. I mean, you know, I've spent hundreds of hours now listening to Grant Sawyer's audio. And I, I did transcribe some of that audio, but it still needed to be listened to. It, it wasn't even as simple as transcribing it and then doing a keyword search. And so I've, I've listened to most of the 37 hours. I can honestly say I've listened to all 37 hours at least twice through. And I've found these pieces that I can, I can write about it. I can write an article. I can write a paper and I can quote him and I can tell you what Governor Sawyer said. I think there's incredible power for the viewer, the listener, to get to hear him tell his story. And that's been a, a really interesting thing about oral history for me is creating that space and that environment for somebody to tell their story in their words, as opposed to telling me. And then I write it and I edit it and I clean it up. And I'd like to think I get most of it right. but. Every once in a while, I read something when I've been interviewed, I'm like, did I say that? And did I say it that way? There's something really appealing to me about the integrity of oral history. Let's go to Governor Sawyer now and let's tell him what an embarrassment it's going to be for you if we don't welcome 
everybody into our state. If we don't welcome everybody into our city and not have any types of, of uh, racial you know, uh, events that happen. So I chose to tell this story in a video medium because our 21st culture is very visually oriented. And I wanted to bring Governor Sawyer's words to life. He died in 1997. And there are all these amazing archival photographs to go with the story that he tells. And the way to bring the story forward and present and make it current and relevant is to use this visual medium. It's how we engage the public and get them interested. I took this thesis off a shelf in the library that had been sitting there patiently for 10 years. And if I want people to know the story, I've got to find a way to engage them and make it interesting. And it's my job as a historian and a storyteller to bring it to them in a way they want to hear it. And you know, of course, with the food project, everything about food is this multi-sensory, it's not just about how it smells or how it tastes, it's about how it looks. It's about the sound of food cooking. And, you know, I remember back when we used to go into restaurants and you could hear drinks being made at the bar and there were all of these sounds. And then of course, there's that, that feeling, what, what does this evoke for me? So I think that the visual medium is very, very important in public history because it's how we engage with our community. In 1955, Squaw Valley won the bid to host the 1960 Winter Olympic Games. 40 miles across the border in Nevada, Reno stood ready as the gateway city and preparations began. It was a game of firsts. The first live broadcast of the games. The first purpose-built Olympic village. The first time computers were used to calculate results. The first use of electronic timing. And it was the first time Reno was integrated as a city stumbled across the story. I was doing the work of a traditional historian and I was in the archives. Uh, I also work with a group in Squaw Valley. We've been trying to get a museum. Uh, Squaw Valley is the only Olympic site in the world without a museum. And I was looking in the archives in the files of Senator Allen Bible, US Senator Allen Bible from Nevada and found these letters from the NAACP written to Senator Bible, to the mayor of Reno, and these allegations of discrimination in housing, in restaurants, in, in the casinos. And I, I didn't know about this. This was, um, I've learned the phrase new history and I stumbled across it. And once I found it, I'm like, this is really an important story and it hasn't been told. And so I really wanted to take it, again, a box that was sitting in our archives, these fragile, thin, onion-skinned letters that were typed on manual typewriters. And I wanted to, to share these. It was, it's been quite the journey. Um, it's been eye-opening because I had no idea. I, like many, suffered from this misperception that because Reno and the state of Nevada share a border with California, that this was a far more progressive place. And it turns out that that's not true. Yeah, I think um, to bring it back to what has come to light through our specific project, and I think it's even come to light in our conversation is that one of the fascinating things about doing food history 
is that it's a very on its at the surface it's a very warm and comforting kind of history so when we are talking about nevada's food culture and the history of northern nevada food in particular one of the go-to um one of the go-to communities that we like to highlight is the Basque community, right? And I think that there's something, and I, I need to do a little bit of work to connect the dots, but I think there's something in celebrating Basque culture that has to do with the relative lack of violence against the Basque community in a historical sense. And this, again, is me not knowing much about Basque history particularly, um, so I could be totally off base here. Um, but I think that there's, Sarah mentioned the Chinese community, right? And Reno and surrounding areas has a very deep history of anti-Chinese violence. Um, we raised, what, f a few blocks of Chinatown in Reno um, precisely to dissuade Chinese settlers from setting down roots here. So I think that there's a, since that history is rife with violence we have a hard time um we have a hard time reckoning with it and contextualizing it and presenting it and so i think that that's something that our food project um reveals in a way is that we have an easy time finding the rich history of basque food culture but we have a harder time reckoning with the cultures the food cultures of communities that may or may not have been targeted with more degrees of violence, right? So I think that there's something there's something found fundamental about the uh, degree of violence in the history that affects how that history then gets told or perpetuated onward. I think um, that's a really great point and makes me think too. Brian and I often were in our initial oral histories meeting with relatively new business owners um, in a part of Reno, the Midtown District that has become very popular within the last probably 10 to 15 years um, and has experienced a lot of economic growth and what some would call gentrification. And so when we asked some of these business owners about it, we struggled with how to ask that question sort of in an upfront and honest way about what has, you know, you opening this business meant for people who lived here previously. Um, and that's, you know, it's an uncomfortable question to ask. And that was often we received uncomfortable answers in return. And I think it's to Brian's point, it's easy to talk about food as this warm, comforting, you know, evidence of a rich culture. And people are very passionate about it. And we want to highlight that. But there also are, you know, kind of dark sides to the story as well, whether it's gentrification, food insecurity, um, food as a tool of imperialism, and then as Brian mentioned, kind of the violence that is missing from a lot of these stories. One of the things that I did not cover in my short documentary, um, when we talk about the history of racism in Nevada, the clavern in the Reno Sparks area per capita was one of the largest in the country. I've recently met a gentleman who is a second generation running the family's dry cleaning business in Carson City in our state capital. And he remembers working there as a high school student in the late seventies and Klansmen bringing in their robes to have them dry clean in the late seventies. And that there were multiple cross burnings um, on the outskirts of town. These are, these are not parts of the history that are discussed. And I think too, about this project and keeping it focused and what I left on the proverbial cutting room floor. And I know that for the three of you and working on Reno Food too, is like a, how do we tell a complete story and we can't tell all of it, not in, in this short time frame. And I think that that's something that, right, we're presenting on, part of our presentation covers um, the broader projects that each of us are entangled with or dealing with, but part of our presentation is focusing on a very specific video. So maybe now is a good opportunity for us to talk about like the specific things that we are presenting and the specific purposes, because Nancy, to your point, I think our video addresses 
this history in a very specific kind of way mm -hmm. um, because of the focus of this specific video, but that inevitably led us to cutting out the uncomfortable conversations about Midtown's expansion, right? We cover Midtown expanding in a very bright and happy tone, right? We don't then cut it with... Um, the the consequences of midtown expanding right we don't we didn't necessarily have space in the video to talk about it we like a good pecan punch so yeah, <laughs> that's just, the unfortunate thing with those is you can only you can't have one you gotta have 15 and then yeah, you yeah. yeah you drink until uh, you can't on those at least no that's, that's my experience <laughs> northern nevada food i mean you get you have to give you have to look at every time period right so there is yeah. the the time when 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 western civilization was was encroaching in the state and then mm -hmm. you have the prohibition era when nevada was finally settled and then you have the post second war where we started getting into the cal neva mm -hmm. and you know if people say what do you get in reno they think you get a 99 cent buffet yeah. Yeah. and that was started right. here yeah. and you can't look do it, you look at your project and and say that's not it because that's part of what we all deal with the mm -hmm. awful awful for god's sake we have to deal with that <laughs> good or bad you have to yeah. You have to look at that and say, yeah, that's part of our history. Yeah, so the purpose, um, it took us, I'll be honest, it took us a while to settle on this specific purpose because we do have so many interesting directions we want to go. Um, you know, each time we meet, we come up with new project ideas and new avenues we want to explore. But as our first sort of public facing piece of the project, we really wanted it to introduce the scope of the project broadly and comment on these different answers we've received about Reno food. Um, but certainly, Cassandra and Brian, I'd love for you guys to add your two cents on what you think the purpose of the video is. Yeah, I think part of it was self-serving in as much as we wanted to give ourselves a blueprint of the various ways in which the project could then blossom, right? Um, we wanted to give, to hint give touch upon a few of the conversations a few of the main conversations that we had had in the context of these admittedly much larger and much messier conversations um, so we, i think we wanted to give a sense for viewers of some of the depths that this project has already and some of the potential that this project has so i think the purpose of this video was to honestly just to pique people's interest in this history which i think is indicative or um, uh, exhibited by the fact that we chose such a, it's kind of like a arguably low hanging fruit in terms of the title of the video, but it's, um, I think it's deliberately low hanging fruit in as much as it's catchy, right? When you see that the title of the video is what is Reno food? It kind of, in a way, it kind of gets the audience to lower their guard a little bit with approaching history, right? Because I think that some people need a little bit of convincing as to what makes history interesting. So I think part of our purpose of the video was to make a really interesting, engaging, somewhat lighthearted, um, but also honest look at a really catchy and uh, or answers to a really catchy question, which is what is Reno food? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you guys nailed it. I think it's, um, you know, some a project that could be accessible to people um, outside of the university, um, outside of just the history department even, um, and just something to get people excited um, and have conversations. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Cassandra. You're good. I was gonna say, I think that sort of community interest is really important to us. Um, because we're kind of coming from the shared history perspective and this idea of co-construction of knowledge and that the community is telling us their stories and we're not just, you know, packaging them up into maybe a book that only academics would read, but we're then making it accessible in turn to people who live in Northern Nevada and throughout the state. And internationally, maybe, you never know. <laughs> And another thing is um, a lot of these, a lot of larger businesses in like the casinos in Reno, they have the ability to archive and chart their history from within. And we, through our project, are telling smaller businesses and people who are um, 
you know, food related, that their, their histories and their stories do matter and they should be archived as well. And they should be available for future generations to call back on. And we owe it to them to share those stories and to not just, you know, set it aside till we're ready to deal with it, but to prioritize putting it out there. How do you guys see your, your films within the larger context of the community of Northern Nevada today? Yes, I'd actually like to respond to that point if I can. Um, that was something that's been really interesting for us to learn and I think relates to how we are contributing to our community and that many people have the misconception that Reno and Northern Nevada doesn't have sort of a deep history of a food culture. Um, many people think it has been restricted to sort of low quality casino dining. And some people still sort of have that perception and that comes up in our video. But we also met many people who were aware of the historic trends of Northern Nevada food, um, which includes Basque American, Spanish, Chinese, and other European food traditions as well. Um, so we kind of want to advocate for our community in that regard and advocate for our food culture, that it isn't just, you know, a cheap buffet you get late at night and then all of a sudden we have amazing food now. It's always been there um, and been present in our community for many years. And I'll go ahead and add to that. I think um, one, of, one of the uh, correlating misconceptions that we unearthed through doing our oral histories, and I think the danger in assuming that Reno was casino buffets until it wasn't, right, is that we might overstate the emphasis of outside influence in Reno. Um, and I think that that's something that we encounter and it's definitely a part of this oral history is how has the influx of people from other regions influenced Reno's food in particular, but Northern Nevada's food culture more broadly speaking. But I think that what our project demonstrates is that A, that influx is not a new phenomenon it's not a new thing as of the 20, the early 2000s, and B, that Reno has and Northern Nevada has a very deep rooted food culture that predates and exists alongside the influx of people from other places. I think that was why we felt it was really important to, in our video, add that sort of six minute section on Nevada's history. And it was very much a broad and fast overview of what boiled down to thousands of years of history, but to kind of show that, you know, Reno didn't just pop up out of nowhere in the 1950s when some of the first major casinos opened. Um, and so even though our oral histories are all contemporary and often focused on contemporary topics, that history is a really important context for our viewers to understand. But also an ongoing culinary culture too. You, you guys talk about the deep rootedness of Great Basin cuisines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can point to uh, members of say the Numu, the um, Pyramid Lake Reservation posting on Instagram, you know, um, delivering fish from the lake to the elders, the tradition continues, right? Um, and people talk actively when you, when you talk to um, folks from different communities across Nevada, um, indigenous communities about how alive their cuisine is today too. So it's not even something just from the past, it's something that is present and now and serving as its own um, route to the contemporary mix of food cultures here. Yes, um, we've heard examples of pine nut lattes. So taking this very traditional ingredient and kind of presenting it in a new and modern form. So I think like everything, food culture adapts and traditions grow over time. Um, it's not static and it's not set completely in the past. When I started this project um, in November, 2019, I knew that it was important. I had no idea what was coming um, six months down the road that the country was going to erupt, that our city was going to erupt. Um, following the death of George Floyd, that 
for so many people in Reno, they don't understand the broader history and they don't understand here. Every single person of color that I interviewed tells me that in 2019 and 2020 and 2021, they're experiencing racism over and covert on an absolute daily basis. We can't bring about effective change without a really deep understanding of how we got to this point. I think what historians bring to the table is this idea of solid fact-based research that um, I'm just not going to tell you about the signs at eye level at every business, at every casino, at every restaurant saying whites only. I'm gonna go into the archives and I'm gonna document that and I'm gonna present facts, I'm gonna present proof. And I think that that's a really important part of why I'm telling the story and why I'm telling it the way that I am, that I'm using the visual medium. I want you to see that newspaper clipping. I want you to see Alice Smith's picture and put that face with those words. Yeah. I wanted actually to circle back to something you said, Sarah. You mentioned shared history. You mentioned um, this collaboration, right? And it recalls you know, some of our discussions about oral history and the process of oral history and Portelli's uh, use of the term inter slash view, right? This, this conversation where um, we're sharing authority, we're sharing this construction of this historical perspective on who we are. Do you guys want to talk about that a bit? My first sort of response to that is that in rewatching many of our interviews in preparation for this video, um, Brian and I became aware that some of our most successful interviews were ones in which we kind of let down our academic shields, as it were, and really just engaged in a conversation with who we were speaking to. Um, and it's really incredible. You can see a difference on film in how our interviewees look in terms of comfort and confidence. Um, and so kind of thinking of that idea of we have things to offer to the interview, but so do our interviewees and they can ask us questions and it will shape the conversation and what becomes the historical record in a really powerful way, I think has really ultimately made the project more effective. Um, and also to kind of letting go of our preconceived list of questions or what we wanted to get out of an interview um, we certainly went down some strange tangents in some of our conversations. Um, sometimes that was the interviewee. Sometimes that was us, you know, sneaking in a question we were personally interested in, um, kind of while we had the person as a captive audience, so to speak. But I think ultimately there's value in that and that the future scholar will unearth Brian's question about 21st century municipal law in Northern Nevada and think they've hit the jackpot in the archive. Um, but to it does, it gave, you know, using that example, it gave the interviewee in that regard, um, who was Tom Adams, the founder of Seven Troughs Distillery, the opportunity to talk more about his role in changing Nevada law to be able to open craft distilleries. And it may not be the most exciting part of the topic, but it's an essential part of the story. And we can't make that call just because we're not interested in it to not include it. Law is kind of a silent partner in both films or not so silent in your case, Nancy. Um. Well, and you know, in some ways it feels really strange for me to be here by myself because this has been such a collaborative project. In addition to my interview with Geralda and I actually did a second interview with her um, last semester continuing this conversation. There have been many, many conversations, met for lunch, met for coffee. I think Brian, you wanted to talk a bit about the collaborative process too. What are we doing for the community? And um, what part of the collaborative process do we serve? Yeah, so I think with the food project in particular, it's a unique case in the context of these two projects in as much as we are interacting 
with and telling a very recent story. Um, and I think part of part of our project too has to deal with I don't know I don't know if it's necessarily like a thorny issue, but an interesting hurdle or obstacle that we faced is that a lot of our interviewees are business owners. So mm-hmm. it's not as much as they they don't anticipate that we'll, you know, patronize their business once a week, but there's something in the give and take of this process that is made interesting by the fact that we're doing this with businesses. Um, so I think there's a there's an obligation in our, in our project to um, to almost advocate for, if not the businesses, then the contemporary food cultures, the staples of the contemporary food scene. Um, and as much as we, we also, part of our um, initial outreach to interviewees also was colored by the fact that we acknowledged that restaurants are one part of the story that we also wanted to have a very clear conversation with food advocates and people who are advocating for improvements in the contemporary scene. Um, unfortunately, we, I, we only got a handful, one or two people who responded back, and that's just a reality of like the time crunch that some of these projects are under, right? Um, but I think that that was part of part of collaborative, part of constructing a collaborative project started the, it started from the get-go of deciding who we wanted to reach out to and then bring in to the fold and then deal with the repercussions of, okay, who responded to our call for interviewees and where are our gaps and how do we fill in those gaps? Um, so I think that that's part of the collaborative part is it starts at the very foundation of who's who's being interviewed, who isn't interviewed just yet, who do we need to reach out to? Um to fill in, you know, this broader history, this broader contemporary moment too. And I think to your earlier point, Dr. Von Age, about, you know, the inter slash view, if we had spoken with a different group of 10 or 11 people in the fall of 2019, when the bulk of our interviews were conducted, we would probably be telling a very different story. Um, so it's not our story that we're telling, it's the community story that we're kind of just helping bring to light and bring to the public. And I think that to kind of to to uh, intersperse this conversation with an earlier conversation that we had about the purpose of video, I think that our particular video project and Nancy yours to a certain degree as well um, allows us to demonstrate the realities of the narrative form of history, we can show that sometimes we have really clear, concise sound bites of people responding to questions. And sometimes that's what history is. It's a very clear question and answer, clear, concise narrative. Um, But most of the times as our video and as our oral histories allowed us to demonstrate, um, most of the time, these historical narratives are coming from this, this, uh, huge I don't, I don't know this huge mess right this huge web of st- of conversations right not even stories necessarily because some of our interviewees were a little bit more narrative and some of them were just a little bit more conversational and i think that doing oral history and then converting it to a somewhat narrative focused video allows us to show that as a process right that history is sometimes a clean and concise narrative with a beginning middle and end but more often than not, history is just like a big, messy mm-hmm. conversation, right? I think one of the strengths of oral history and of video is that both sort of methods show that human messiness, as Brian was kind of talked about with the messiness of history, but then also that you know emotional and physical connection um, that sometimes doesn't come through as strongly in, you know, a paper source that has been sitting in the, you know, infamous dusty archive for many years. So, and the paper source, as as I'm when I'm writing a paper, my questions are implied, but they're not actually part of the document that I create, and I think that's one of the 
really important parts of oral history is that, you know, we are co-creators. And I really see that come through in these projects that um, the work that we do as interviewers and holding space and then the people who share their stories with us that um, it's, it's a co-creator, it's a collaborative process. I think the beauty of oral history and doing it in this visual medium with video is that we're literally taking a snapshot of a moment in time. This is us where we are today and wanting to do more than just archive it and stick it in a vault somewhere to share those stories now, but also very mindful that this is going into the vault. I think that's really, really important, especially after this last year that we've had. Yeah, I um, think that was very well put, Nancy. And I think from the get-go, the Rito Food Project has known that we wanted to share our stories with the community as soon as we could and kind of not wait till everything was archived and we could, you know, turn it into this broad thesis, but that we just wanted to make people in our community aware. Um, and I think Basque American food is a great example. You know, the Santa Fe, which had been open for many years and gone through different forms of ownership closed recently as a result of um, the economic impact of the pandemic. And I think the food project has the opportunity to remind people in Northern Nevada of all of our gems that are here to make them aware of businesses and restaurants and bars and distilleries and farms that they haven't had an opportunity to visit yet. And kind of also too, to just, you know, you watch our video and you think of Louie's Bass Corner and suddenly a pecan punch sounds really good. And maybe you'll go down there that weekend with your family and enjoy um, the family style food. So I think, you know, we are interacting a lot with businesses and doing what we can to preserve um, that Northern Nevada culture that's unique to our area. Let's talk a little bit about what people know about the history of Northern Nevada. And, I, and I'm struck by the excerpt you took of Geralda Miller's interview that you did with her a year ago, pre-pandemic, and that part that you include in the documentary where she talks at the end of your documentary about what people want to know, what people know, and what people should know. And then goes on and says, this is, you know, this is all of our history. This is American history, right? There are just these silences here locally in our own his, in our own sense of our own history, regional history, you know, urban history, um, statewide history. I'd love to hear all of your perceptions, especially those of you who grew up here, um, about what we need to know about our own history. And I think that's partially informing both of the projects too. Well, as someone from Southern Nevada, um, I could say that most of my peers from Southern Nevada know very little about what goes on beyond the, beyond the limits of Las Vegas. Um, so there's, I could not have told you that the Olympics ever happened here until um, I moved up to Northern Nevada. I, I would know the names of towns, but um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much history even if you talk to people in Las Vegas, they've never even heard of Basque culture. Um, there's just this major disconnect between Southern um, Nevada, Nevada's history and what happens in the rest of the state. I think disconnect is a great way to put it. Um, I grew up in Reno and so kind of knew the broad strokes of Nevada history, but in doing some research for this project and this video, I became aware that at one point, Virginia City had um, the largest Chinese population in the West. And this was around the boom of mining with the Comstock load. And I don't think that's something that is taught in our schools or even in sort of general public history programs um, because there's a lot of other stuff teachers have to get through, I wanna give them their credit. But so that was really interesting to me and kind of why don't we talk more about this influence in our culture and on our state 
and also sort of the less pleasant ramifications of that as well. I mean, that population is no longer present because of Chinese exclusion and racism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So I think there's sort of these nuggets you can unearth. And I think unearth is a word we're gonna end up using a lot in talking about these projects. Um, you know, Nancy made the point about people not being aware of Nevada's racist history and the continued racism. And I think that there are a lot of aspects of Nevada history that we can sort of bring to light through these projects and by applying a different lens. Um, so one example that I thought of, you know, was let's look at the influence of Chinese cooking and Chinese cuisine in our state. What still exists? What record is there? Um, you know, how can we see that shaping the history? So. Yeah, we know there's a, was a vibrant African American community in Virginia City mm -hmm. at its peak, right? And it's and we've located it on the map. And so the African-American community, small part of the overall population in Northern Nevada, but they've been here since the get-go. We know that there was a Latino population in Virginia, city of Californios and Chilenos and Sonorenses and others who came up first to the gold rush and then came over to the Comstock. And they were some of the earliest um, individuals to begin the process of mining and development of those resources. And there's a big community there. We how has this all, the process of doing both films affected your sense of the role of the historian, the product of history or products of history? Has it at all? Hugely. I used to think that I was doing this interesting thing. I mean, certainly it's fabulous. You know, you're at a dinner party. Oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a historian. But I never really saw that I was contributing something important to my community, to society, um, until I started working on these projects and realized that these are voices that would otherwise be lost. These are stories that are interesting and compelling and part of the fabric of our lives, but not stories that make the nightly news that when you pick up your newspaper in the morning, this not only isn't on page one, it's not even buried somewhere in the paper. And this really profound sense of my responsibility to my community. somebody else answer that. I mean, why have you guys chosen history? Why history? Other than it makes for a fabulous conversation point at a cocktail party. I feel like next you're going to ask me what I want to do with my degree. I'm getting a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask. Okay, mom. Really, I think this is what we do with our degrees is that we collect these stories, we curate them, we share them with the world, and we preserve them. I, I'm kind of a broken record, but Dr. Von Nagy, at the beginning of the pandemic, when mm. you asked us, what is history going to, what are historians going to want from us? You know, and I think about my role as, as a historian. When I take on this project or any project, why does this matter? Why do we care? And for me, that's the thing that, that drives me, but also I might not have had anything to do with the development of a vaccine or a treatment for this virus, but I have certainly captured something, a piece of us, of who we are. Why did you choose to do the epilogue? Because I really felt that this story needed to be placed in context. You wouldn't think under normal circumstances, what difference does a year make? But following the protests in downtown Reno, City Hall was the whole first floor is all glass and all that glass was broken during the riots. 
and then the decision made to paint murals on the plywood so that it was this temporary art installation and hiring a black artist um, to, to paint these murals, to give a voice. It, it had to be placed in, in context that this interview started in 2019 and then in the end of May in 2020, everything changed overnight. And I felt that I had to address that, but at the same time, this, this story is about the 1960 Winter Olympics being a catalyst for the civil rights movement. And it's a story about Geraldo's thesis. And in a lot of ways, I take a chapter out of her thesis mm -hmm. and bring it to life. And I, it felt awkward until I added that, what is that, 30 seconds at the end of an epilogue. Mm -hmm. It felt unfinished, it felt incomplete. And I, I needed to place it, history, change over time. Yep. And this idea that everything we do in, in applied history and shared history, this is our history. I think it connects it to the idea that Geralda really um, brings forth and, and when she says this is American history because the Black Lives Matter protests in Reno and, the, and what happened here in City Hall and the murals that follow that and everything that's happened since then is connected to intimately part of a larger discourse, dialogue, larger injustices, struggles for justice that are national, right? And Reno has its own, or Northern Nevada has its own part in that, but it's part and parcel. This is not something that takes place elsewhere, right? We had these protests here because this is relevant. It's part of our history. It's part of our history that hasn't been talked about a lot. To let Nevadans, Renoites, America know and to be a part of something so big really touches me. I always said that Reno needs to know its history. Nevada needs to know its history. You know, but now, even now, I say America needs to know its history, that we still don't know, don't want to know. and accept the impact of American history. What we're talking about here isn't black history. What we're talking about here is not African American history. It's all of our history. It's Americans' history. And that's what we need to, as a people, finally agree to and accept. Really the purpose of this video was to take a piece of, it's not even forgotten history. It's, you know, one of those pieces that was previously unknown. I remember the first time somebody looked at me and said, this is new history. And I'm like, oh, this is new history that um, you know, it was hiding in plain sight, these mm -hmm. letters and archives. And to really provide something that can be used in a classroom. Honestly, I hope um, one, of, one of our professors here at UNR has asked to use the video. I'm like, yes, please. 
And I'm really hoping, um, I have some friends who teach high school in the district and I'm starting to share the video with them. They're saying, can I show this to my class? Yes, that's why I did this. Um, that through the power of social media, that this story gets out there, that people start to come to understand where we're at and therefore have a better understanding of where we go from here. You know, it's no accident that I'm asking that question and that Dr. Martin Luther King's last book that he was working on when he was assassinated was titled, Where Do We Go From Here? So it's partly about telling a story, but this is also a call to action and developing the relationships and the trust with people asking them to share their stories with me and really learning how to hold that space for them to share all of their story and how they feel about it and to not interject, to not move to fill the quiet space. Um, if you watch the whole video, you'll see that that very last segment I don't edit it. I don't cut away. I don't put pictures in. We just sit there with Geralda telling us an incredibly intimate part of her story. And I want people to see that. I want people to stop and think. And Geralda talks about if one person watches this video, and has a, a, a conversation with the person in the mirror about my whiteness, my white privilege, and what else I need to do. So it's informative, it's storytelling, but it's also a call to action.